Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. We are uh, at the uh, celebration of uh, February 14th, 2024. But for our church year, that is Ash Wednesday. Our first reading uh, for Ash Wednesday is Joel chapter 2, verses 1 through 2 and 12 through 17. The psalm is the 51st Psalm, 1 through 17. Our second reading is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 20b through 6, verse 10. And our gospel is Matthew 6, verses 1 through 6, and then 16 through 21. Um, And we'll look at these texts in relationship to Ash Wednesday as opposed to Valentine's Day. Yeah. Yeah, right. If you're looking for our separate St. Valentine podcast, yes. you can find Keep that searching. on the website. Talk That's about right. Valentine and the history of Valentine. No, 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 don't go there because no. there's no such thing. It's not there. there it uh, is not. Yeah. It's not there. No. Yeah. No. no. Yeah, so these are always the texts, which means if you don't like this podcast, there's a whole bunch more you can find on the website where we may or may not have said the same thing in previous years. But, uh, you know, I think the challenge is always, what does this mean uh, This usually in, this afternoon or tonight, not all churches, whenever your service is on a mm-hmm. Wednesday, and mm-hmm. it's usually not a ton of preaching, but I don't know. I think the, it's hard to imagine avoiding the Matthew text because it's... Mm-hmm. It just says, beware of what you do in public. And so people are going to think, well, what are we doing here then? Um, And uh, the NRSV UE has helpfully changed piety back to righteousness, which is what it should be in that first verse. And uh, so it's just, yeah, yeah, it raises questions about righteousness and reward, Mm -hmm. which is one of the themes through this. So what is it? What is this righteousness that Matthew's? Jesus, I should say Jesus in Matthew is talking about, and what kind of reward is he talking about? Mm-hmm. And rewards is language that makes a lot of us Protestants nervous, but it's there it is. It's all over um, in the Sermon on the Mount. And, and and righteousness here is not necessarily moral perfection as much as I think it's about being in line with God's priorities, which in Matthew are always about mercy. And so mm-hmm. it's, I don't know. I don't think that this passage tells us that we're making mistakes in our Ash Wednesday observances, but it's, I think it's saying, what is this piety for? What is this act for? And I think it's supposed to be an initiator. Do you know what I mean? It's not like the receiving of ashes. When you're done, you look in the mirror, you think about your mortality, but implicit to me is always the question. So then how are you going to live? Like what's this Mm -hmm. going to initiate Mm -hmm. in your own life? And before you start screaming works righteousness, you know, it's it's this idea of what does it mean to participate in this grand new vision Jesus has. Actually, it's an old vision, new and old vision for the world. So that's what I would want to do is say this is not getting the ashes is not this is the beginning of a mm-hmm. of a of a journey that's not just a journey to the cross on Good Friday. It's it's um it's a kind of a it maps a journey of discipleship, I think, on our very bodies. I'm really glad that you mentioned that change that the NRSV UV UE. Okay. Yeah. NRSV updated edition. UE. Yeah. UE. UE is, yeah, translates piety back to righteousness. That is so helpful because. Really, I mean, I, we're still in the Sermon on the Mount, and of course, one of the Beatitudes, how the Sermon on the Mount opens, is "Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness." And so, this these actions uh, practices are about that which benefits others and serves God. And and so, how is it that righteousness is manifested and embodied? And so, I, I, it's really helpful. F- to think about that this is not like a one time you know cross on your forehead but it's uh it's the way in which the way in which we promise to or commit ourselves to hungering for that righteousness and what are those practices that that we will engage in or that we will commit ourselves to that that are about serving God and benefiting others and i the other thing i would say here 
is, I, I, I don't know if you want to, I don't know how much you want to add the verses, but I really do think that, that five through 15 are really, are critical for this, mm-hmm. for this passage and thinking about the overall sense of what is being called upon here of practicing righteousness uh, because it's prayer, right? So it's giving to others um, prayer and then fasting. And so, uh, so all of these, all of these things are connected and, and so how is it that that prayer functions in a way that is necessary for embodying righteousness and practicing righteousness and committing to righteousness and so that these that these practices are intertwined uh, in in ways that I think are 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 it can be it can offer some specificity to this sermon rather than sort of uh, an Ash Wednesday sermon maybe rather than sort of a uh, sort of a general description of what Ash Wednesday means and what it should right. do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it, you know what I mean? Like it just adds a little bit, like some specificity to, uh, to what, uh, to what we are embarking upon as you, the language you used, Matt, of this Lenten um, movement. As a Methodist, um, I appreciate the definition of what we mean by piety. Um, uh, but as a Methodist, I'm not going to lose this idea of piety because I think um, what we do when we practice uh, Ash Wednesday uh, or when we note, um, the, as you put back in context, Caroline, prayer and uh, uh, giving to others and fasting, these are traditions. And so a part of our Methodist tradition is this idea of piety but we've lost understanding what that means. And so to recover the, uh, the understanding of righteousness and righteousness being embodied in this, uh, gen- this mercy, I think is, uh, is something that we want to have occur uh, as a result of being together in this service, rather than this service being for the head to tell us. Um, and and so here I want to turn to uh, 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 the commentary that Alicia Vargas made. And one, I'm definitely stealing this term, homiletical meanderings. I love that. Um, but I love this question uh, that is posed. Are there stories from the congregation's life, either individual or communal, of a clear focus on God and God alone, to the exclusion of all earthly considerations? What has that been like? Comforting, liberating, stressful, fearful? What are the growing edges of these stories? And I think in that um, homiletical meandering, um, that's exactly what we were talking about, and particularly what you were talking about, Caroline, in this sense of turning the attention of this event back to where God is active and evident uh, in the communal life of this congregation. And uh, uh, I, I, uh, not now I can't remember who, who said this, not uh, a, a for the head explanation, but a recounting of these are the things that have happened in our community that are right, righteous, that demonstrate um, why Jesus, why we tell this story of Jesus um, over and over again and why we want to understand it so clearly. Anything else on that? Of course. Of no, I was going to say I love the Joel. You, d- Matt. I think you said. Um, of course, we got to do the Matthew text, and yes, we do. But I do the Matthew text as a reminder for us not to be boasting, not to, um, you know, d- 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 for the, for me that Matthew text, it it lives out the Joel text. Uh, I I I've said this before. Uh, I think the Joel text is about shouting out. Uh, somebody ought to say something. And these are the things that need to be said. A recognition uh, that God is is present, that God hasn't uh, given up on us, that God is on the move, and um, that our response to this awesome God that we uh, were 
reminded of last Sunday on Transfiguration uh, Sunday. This this awesome God uh, is being faithful to the promises that God has made. And a, a question um, that comes up is, is that good news for everybody? And maybe it needs to be presented in a way that we recognize we need to hold on to our seats and buckle up because it might not sound like mm-hmm. good news if we're honest. Yeah, what you say, Joy, makes me think as well about how the, the, the for everybody part and how this is also a communal call. Yes. And Joel here, and I don't mean that just like, oh, it's not just about my sin, it's about our communities, but then how does how does a congregation do this kind of gathering even for the sake of people who don't recognize themselves as part of that community, right? It's yes. The way it ends, you know, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people. I just wonder liturgically how that plays itself out. Not that not that you want to spend all of your time confessing the sins of people who aren't in the room. I don't mean it like that. But, but how does the church better? How does an individual congregation somehow... Thank you for that. Try to hold all of this with, and do that in a way that's not, I don't know, that's not more, it doesn't make us feel self righteous or that doesn't create weird scapegoats outside the walls. You know what I mean? But I don't know. Mm-hmm. It's somebody the last, more liturgically creative than I would have. It's the yeah, last ahead. verse there in, in, in the, the passage that is read. Um, and and the questions, the the homiletical meandering from the Matthew te- uh, commentary. Uh, what are the things that will cause our actions in our sphere of influence as a congregation to enable people to know that our God is present, and rather than ask, "Well, where is their God?" Because that that that's the opposite of that, you know. How how much of what is mm-hmm. what is happening in our world today is people saying, "I don't know that I want to be a part of that community. I definitely am not sure I want to be under that community's God." If the result of their God's teaching results in that kind of community, this text is the exact opposite of that. That there's a sarcasm in the way that that te- that that last verse is 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 articulated. Um, uh, let the, the, b- between the, uh, where is it? Where where do I begin? Um, why should it be said among the peoples? Where is their God? Why? Well. If we were being faithful and being righteous and practicing that righteousness, people will be saying, I want this God. Yeah. Right. Thanks. (laughs) And I think, yeah, and listening to the two of you, one of the important correct, not maybe correctives, but, and I I know we've talked about this before and the way in which Lent can be so... Uh, individually focused. This is what I'm going to do to um, whatever you decide to do, give up chocolate or I don't know, but uh, which I won't do, but no, no more. It becomes just. I'm at the pop. I'm at the soda. I'm at. Okay. All right. Uh, but it becomes such an individually focused kind of season. And how is it that we as uh, as preachers are always calling attention to the communal representation of the, of 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 the of the glory of God in our in our communal congregational actions? And for me, then the uh, the the Joel text and then the second Corinthians text, rather than maybe preaching on them specifically, they become, both of them offer refrains for me that the preacher could get, get at this. And that is, return to me with all your heart. That's what Mm -hmm. God says to us. Mm -hmm. Return Mm -hmm. me with all your heart. How is that Lent? Return Mm -hmm. to me with all your heart. Uh, or be reconciled to God. So it, it so return to me and reconciled to God. What this is about is about uh, about 
our relationship with God. It's not these, again, not these public acts of, of, of goodness, but it's about what's at stake is our relationship with God. And how do we have that both individually and corporately? And so that's where I would, that's where I would take these two texts and say, Mm -hmm. uh, here, here are, here is some vocabulary to get at what, what Lent can be about. And in that way, uh, the, the verse three as well, we are putting no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found in our ministry. And, and that would allow for me uh, to attend to what you've said and what Matt was saying about the communal nature of this, the acts that we do here, uh, not allowing it to be uh, individualized. And that gave me a new reading of Psalm 51, um, we're very aware, uh, particularly uh, uh, recent scholarship, has been very attentive to David's individual failure. And Psalm 51, uh, we believe, is the text that David writes, or, you know, the, the prayer, uh, David's response to Nathan calling him out. Um, and with uh, this idea that we're talking about of the communal nature of our acts— David is doing this not simply for David. David's doing this for the for the community, for the people of God. That um, the lineage that he is a part of, that will be the promised lineage of the people that God is working through for the sake of all the world. So even Psalm fifty one, a very private individual, have mercy on me, O Lord is to remove the obstacle of this king's act so that the king's ministry, the king's work for not just Israel, but for the sake of all the world that Israel's actions are for. God is blessing all the world through the descendants of Abraham and Sarah. So there needs to be no obstacle in their ministry. The Well, I think uh, Courtney Paces Commentary is really helpful there that uh, she talks about this, though he committed sinful acts as an individual, there were real effects of David's actions on other people. Mm-hmm. And so when we are reconciled, God, when we return to the Lord, that's part of that acknowledgement. It's that it's uh, that it's not not just our individual individual acts of or lack of acts of righteousness. It's not just about us, but how does our inability or unwillingness to hunger for righteousness affect others? And that's uh, that needs to be a focus for absolutely uh, for a congregation, for a community, for an individual during the season of Lent. My one thought on on the Psalm is, um, I, I'm glad nobody reads my prayers. Oh yes, yes. <laughs> After the fact, like you know, um, it's easy to pick this psalm apart mm-hmm, and say, "Well, mm-hmm. you missed this part, David." Or about this part, you know. Um, Come on, right? And and yeah. the psalm because of course it's scripture and because it gets recited, you know, it's taken on a whole different life. But to play with it back in that original context. We can only repent for, we can only confess what we're able to see at a given moment. Yeah. You know what I mean? And and yeah. so I like that the that the prayer, again, I've been critical of the prayer in the past and still am, but it's, if you take it, this is a prayer frozen in time by an imperfect person who hasn't yet maybe even grasped the full extent of his sin, which of course would qualify then to everybody. Do you see what I mean? And so then how does the prayer become an encouragement? Don't wait for perfect knowledge. Don't wait for perfect yes. sorrow before yes. you come to God with confession, mm. right? We always talk yes. about how forgiving others is a process, forgiving yourself is a process, and even coming to terms with it. So maybe maybe there's a way if you wanted to really delve into this particular prayer in that that narrative setting to, to do that. And then, yeah, that would be my closing line. Like, thank God nobody reads my confessions. <laughs> but he transcribes those and realize how self-centered most of my confessions probably are, right? Or how how um, 
how dis- sealed off from the the world and the consequences of my actions I probably am. And how this I'm not saying this about- to confess to you too. You don't have to say it's okay. <laughs> And uh, oh, you know well, what I mean? Some ways, it kind of gets, yeah. fear gets messed up. In yeah, some ways, the fear I was gets messed say, up when we ask people to recite it. True. Yeah. And and in some ways, this is how it turns to become about God, because God responds. What's the word? Where, yeah, yeah. Where David is in this imperfect confession. So I love your line, Matt, don't wait until you get it perfect before you start saying, I'm going to, you know, take this path toward righteousness. Um, And have in mind, again, this from, from, from second Corinthians, um, that we, we, we don't, we want to take the steps so that nothing we have done becomes an obstacle for others. Second Corinthians, then, just to wind it up. Yeah, you've uh, here. You get. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad nobody has written down all of my my complaints either, because here you get Paul. Like, here's all the stuff I've endured, <laughs> which makes me sound like all the ways I've thought. Like, here are all the ways I felt unappreciated. You know, but um, I'm glad that's not in writing for the whole world to see. Uh, but the again, the way in which Paul describes his struggles in ministry as appropriate to himself, appropriate mm-hmm. to his own way of viewing his life, appropriate to his own sense of what does it mean to be called as an apostle so that we don't turn this into a kind of like list of virtues, right? That somehow, you know, you've got to go and pursue all of these hardships to really be a true disciple. Which I do not think is what Paul means, but it can come out that way if we don't explain where this is coming from and from whose, whose mouth or whose pen it's coming from. Is that it? You must have more to say on Second Corinthians. The thought I had around that was simply that um, while we find fault in Paul, as we have found fault in David, um, it's important, I think, for each one of us, um, well, one, to find, to recognize our own fault, but to attend to what can be gained by seeking this righteousness of God, or more importantly, remembering how much is lost um, when leaders lack humility. And at the end of the day, in Psalm 51, and even in this text where Paul is trying to be in ministry for others, um, there there is great humility, and we need our leaders to have that kind of humility.